Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time. I am Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer. Matt Doyle, dressed for fall. <laughs> David Goss. You already got the flannel out. Stefano Fusaro. 55 degrees in the jealous. studio. I'm jealous. <laughs> I'm a big time, you know, flannel shacket guy. Mm-hmm. Shirt jacket. Mm-hmm. Got three in the this closet. This is my first one, actually. Oh, I've never had to a, the club. a jacket before. Mm, welcome to the club. Which of you has a Sounders Orca hat? In the mail on the way to you. Anybody here? Yeah. None of us are as shameless mm, as yeah. you when it comes to reaching out how, to club personnel to yeah. get how swag. quickly how quickly did that now, Ebo go out? Hold on. <laughs> hold on. In this case, unlike this Rapids jersey, beautiful mm-hmm. Rapids jersey, which did arrive shamelessly, Connor Close, a listener of this show, reached out to me unprompted and has sent me a Sounders Orca hat after the rebrand this week. This was unprompted, zero shame. He knew me so well. I didn't have to shame myself to get this free merchandise. Won't take payment. I owe him beer. Wow. Yeah. Just Hard saying. to find a good beer in Seattle. Yeah, it's been pretty difficult. Did you did you us. give this guy your home address? Um, I give him the studio address. So I'll have, <laughs> okay, uh, right, I'll, right. have I'll have you open the package next week. All right. <laughs> no, no, I'm all good. Right. No, I'm I good. trust I'm you, good. Connor. I trust you completely. Speaking of please answered by our listeners, who I love and never troll. Our iTunes reviews are a bloodbath. It's come to my <laughs> attention that uh, they have many requests. They 50% improvement if I just jettison Doyle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, if I that, stop talking. That comment, that comment was from a couple of years ago, though. Yeah. So we probably already lost yeah, that we've listener. Lost that. Yeah, gone. there's no ROI on that anymore. Mm, if you're going to go to iTunes to write a review, that means you hate listening enough. <laughs> yeah, you're still, you're still, whoever that is is still around. Yeah. Also, if I talk less, so I'm going to do my best in the show to talk just a little bit less. But I am asking our listeners, if you like the show, if you don't like the show, I guess you still have that option. But if you like the show. Hit us with a review. I don't yeah, know what it new, does. Let's get some new content. Yeah, in. just some new material. Preferably positive, but we'll take a mixed bag. A five star with a roast actually is my preferred yeah. format here. It would be a bit. It would be, we, which above. people don't like. Yeah. I, I don't understand what iTunes reviews actually do. I hear other podcasts say, say it would it's help a, it's us a must. out of top. Need, like, yeah. Feels like a, a scam. Like I don't know that it actually would help us, but if it did, go ahead and. Hit us up with that. Uh, U.S. Open Cup final. Let's just jump right into it. Best thing we saw, Houston Dynamo lifting a cup. James Harden there to witness it with the entourage, with the bling. Ben Olsen running around like a crazy man afterwards. I think we can just all agree, except for maybe... No, I'm happy. For, I'm happy for you. I lived there for six years too, so I can. Take, oh, that's true. I, I can take that as a win as well. Yeah, I forgot yeah. you were just be shameless. Around. Can't lose playing ball. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm almost as shameless as we be asking for uh, for MLS gear. You're the guy in the concourse wearing a Dynamo jersey with Messi on the back. Right? <laughs> I'm trying to hide that guy. So <laughs> it, was, it, was, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Do you have the heat jersey with Willard on the back? Or? Oh, wow. All right, oh, Andrew. I've listened to like two hours of NBA talk today and I had nothing to contribute. And I finally had something. Congratulations to the Houston Dynamo. 2-1 winners in Fort Lauderdale at Drive Pink Stadium. A 2-0 lead in the first half. We're absolutely putting it on Inter Miami, who sort of turned it around. But not enough. Guess who didn't play? Lionel Messi was watching. Pitch side, Jordi Alba did not play in this one. Sergio Busquets maybe wishes he didn't play. Had some rough moments. Doyle, what's the best moment from this? What's the memorable moment from this U.S. Open Cup final? I, I, I think the whistle blowing and everybody looking like, oh, is that actually over? Like, it didn't seem to sink in, especially for the Dynamo players for about 10 seconds. And then it, it was bedlam. And it's a great story. It, it really is. Um, we had said a month ago when Houston qualified that that alone makes this a successful season. Like just getting to the final and being a team that's in the hunt for the playoffs. Well, now we're talking about a team that has won the U.S. Open Cup and is in the hunt for a top four seed in the Western Conference, which means home field advantage in the first round. And Houston are very, very good at home. But also, they're very, very good on the road when they can play their game. And that was what was so great about this. Just a joy to watch Ben Olsen's Houston Dynamo, uh, Joga Benito is what they're calling it now. Uh, they they play beautiful soccer. And Ache Ache uh, had an interview with, I think it was Pablo and Felipe at, at The Athletic, where he was talking, they asked him, like, what what are, you know, talk to us about the tactics and, and what Ben Olsen has um, sort of instilled into this team. And Hector Herrera kind of laughed. He's like, it's it's more about, 
sort of freelancing and understanding that we have a bunch of players who are good with the ball and good without the ball. And the way we play comes from that. It's not set patterns. It's more principles. Music to my ears. I loved hearing. Look, I, I love super um, in-depth and minute tactics as well. But I think most teams in MLS are better off being a team of principles rather than hard and fast positional play. And that's what the Dynamo are. They trust Ace Ace and they trust Coco Karaskia and they trust Artur, who was immense yeah. last night, to run the show. And if you're going to beat them, you're going to have to disrupt them. And Miami never came close to that. And 2-1 was the final. Um, this one, like, it could have been 4-0 by the hour mark. Yeah. Houston were so much better than Miami for the vast majority of this game. And that shows their strength. And the fact that it was only two kind of shows their weakness. Yeah. They still don't have, you know, the the firepower in that front line. But that doesn't make them any less fun to watch. Like, this team is a joy. They are. And I think what's interesting for Houston is the dichotomy of 2018 when they won U.S. Open Cup because it's a cup and anything can happen and you can – accidentally win and now you're in the next round and you can sort of grind out results to now five years later of they won the u.s open cup because they have a defined style because they were the best team because they are going in the right direction because the pieces they put together share the same soccer brain yeah you can only freelance yeah. if everyone sees the game the same way because that run that movement the back heels no team in mls tries as many back heels because <laughs> bossy knows that Coco is making that run. And Coco knows that Ache Ache is making that run because they're all similar. And that's what I think is really fun about what they put together is they have the right talent for Ben Olsen to put out there and say, you guys can all play the way you feel and the way we want to play. Cause you all see it the same way that I do. And I think that's, what's really exciting. And that's, what's really exciting about this victory is 2018 was special because it was a high point for a bad time. Mm -hmm. This is a it feels process like a start that's going in the right direction. Yeah. And it is proof that it is working. And that is, there are two different ways you can win a trophy and this is the best way possible. Yeah. I, I, I I'm happy for them. I'm happy for that franchise uh, with, you know, it, it's been such rough times for the last, you know, five years and even before that. So it is good to see them. I'm happy for Ben Olsen as well. Uh, for him, for them to come in, and they're definitely ahead of schedule, right? I don't think that they were planning on being involved and planning on winning a trophy so early. So it was great to see. And you mentioned Arthur. We we talk about Coco Kajewski and, and Achiacha so much, uh, and, and Bossy as well. But I think the key to all that is having Arthur behind them, not them not having to worry so much about having to 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 go on that side of the field and having to protect themselves, giving them that space to freelance and go forward. I think has been so key. Uh, could we see more firepower like you mentioned? Yeah, but it's beautiful soccer. I think we need to celebrate that. They were the better team by far last night. Uh, and I think that this is, uh, it's, it's a great start for them. I feel like you said, it feels like something that's beginning and that they could be going in the right direction for the next several years. Paul Feldman saw that as well. Achi Achi and Coco Carasquilla are clearly the class of the Dynamo midfield and also super fun for Americans to say with the correct Spanish pronunciation. But how good of a signing was our tour? He emailed this two weeks ago. Nice. So Paul was... You already go. saw it. Love yeah. that. Third so, eye open. No, I mean, Injury there were questions there. about Artur given the, the injuries he had had over the past couple of years with Columbus. But he has, I think it took him about half this season to, to really start looking like the 2019, 2020 version of Artur. And, and he's one of the eight best defensive midfielders in the league. And that might be underselling it. And by the way, he's also um, the subject of my favorite picture in American soccer this year when he got his U.S. citizenship. His friends um, had got, maybe this was last year, but they had gotten him a basket full of goodies and included in that was Howard Zinn's people's history nice. in the United States. It's like, all right, this guy, That's he's good. got it. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, there have been other similarities. The first one that comes to mind is obviously Ilya Sanchez moving yeah. from SKC. That was a little bit different because I don't think also Ilya, a recent U.S. citizen. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Ilya ever had the success with SKC that Arthur had with Columbus. But like this was a conversation of Greg Berhalter wanted him to get citizenship yeah. to play for the U.S. because at the peak of a lot of what Greg Berhalter did for Columbus, Arthur was central to it. I mean that passed to Griff Dorsey, you know, on the overlap. Like that was like. He, he created the angle. He laid it into the run. Perfect weight in stride. I'm not saying he did it all. It's a great finish from Griff Dorsey. But like this is 
This is what you want from yeah. your six, man. And there are a few sixes that can pass the way he does and see it the way he does. And, and are team- still hard as hell and will... By yeah. the way, is is it always been Griff? Is this like a new thing? Is this scoring a final <laughs> Griff? Like it's not Griff. Oh, we're he's, just straight. He's Griff always now? been Griff to me. I don't I know think, why. But, man bun Griff. Like I how think did I he... got texts from some Toronto fans who said Big Griff when he scored. So right. he's been doing. I'll it for go a Big while. Griff. Go, a huge so, goal by him. Matt Griffin Dorsey story, which I may have already told, is uh, apparently he came out of the off season last year to the Houston front office and said, "I think I should try and play fullback." It wasn't them saying, yeah. we don't think you fit at winger. Can we check his DMs? Bobby Warshop? Probably, there? yeah. <laughs> Kalen Carr, even. Yeah, right. But, like, I think when you talk about teams that win, you find these little stories, which I'm sure you could find them in teams that don't win, and then they don't seem as meaningful. But this is one where you're, like, recognizing his role in a team, what he can do for a team, what he can do in his career. And uh, Toronto sort of tried him at wing back a little bit, and it didn't work because – Clearly, Toronto's a train wreck, and there's yeah. probably other issues going on there. Um, but, like, this is a team that brought Brad Smith in for some using resources, and they play him as a backup winger, and he comes off the bench and changes the game. And, like, Griffin Dorsey starts in a, a, in a U.S. Open Cup final for them, scores an unbelievable go, goal, gives them with. It's huge what he does because Bossy comes inside all the time and plays as another center mid or Coco floats in that area as well. They don't get a ton of natural width on the right side, so someone has to do that from the fullback position and it all fits together. I think it's one of those things where when you look at this team, it's like slowly was, well, not slowly because a lot over the last year and a half, but put together in interesting ways, each piece where you look at it and you say, maybe I didn't know that that's how that was going to fit in, but it's all fit together in a really impressive way. They did this without a designated player that they have that's on loan, which you would hope they'll replace. They did this without some of the players that they brought in that we thought would be difference makers like an Yvonne, Franco coming into this season that aren't really. And so it's impressive what they've done. And I think part of the combo that you guys are having of like, this feels like the start is now they can go get a center forward that fits into that soccer DNA. Do you get a center forward or do you get a winger? That's not like we're, we're I'm derailing all, all the way to the off season for Houston, but like, do you get, cause like Corey Barrett's had a really good year. He scored 15 goals, all competitions. He's got, seven eight assists part of what's working for houston over the past four months really is his chemistry with the center backs behind him because he doesn't need the ball and he doesn't play like a traditional hold up number nine he floats he finds gaps and then he has flair in the box i like i almost think if you're houston you go out and you say okay let's if we're gonna add a dp we we don't need a traditional number nine based upon how good we've been this year what we need like their version of Dennis Buanga a goal scoring direct winger who threatens in behind but we're, we're getting well far I would just here. if it was me I would want to find my Alan Pulido a quote-unquote nine who mm-hmm. can play and connect but will be a better finisher inside the 18 when those moments fall for them they also executed Canona's loan. So he's a full-time player and Bossy plays on the other wing. So I think you're right. I think they have options. But I, I talk about this all the time of like, if you can make a signing into your system that other people don't want, your nine is probably not the same nine that St. Louis right. is going to go sign or that LAFC is looking at. And I think that's to your advantage because you now have this unique style that other play- other teams especially in this league, aren't playing. We'll dig into what Pat Onstead and Asher Mendelson and that entire front office did in turning over much of the roster. When Pat arrived, there were some serious handcuffs based on the previous regime, on DP spots, on cap situations, a lot of trades, a lot of moves to alleviate that. But the biggest move is pretty clear. It was Ben Olsen. Yeah. And we heard from many sources last year about the environment and the dynamo at the end of the season, how miserable Ache Ache was. He confirmed it in that interview with The Athletic. He was like, I, I was like, what the F am I doing here? He's talking to his partner about, like, should we just leave? Should we bounce? Pat Onstead went to a guy he trusted and Ben Olsen. And it was a guy that if I think we listened back to our show when this was announced, we would not, we, we were not like, forget effusive in praise. I'm sure that we were like, what is this? This doesn't represent ambition. Like, I'm just trying to predict what we said. And I think I have the receipt. I think Anders specifically was like, this won't work. This is a terrible. Yeah, thing. it's yeah. definitely on. You remember him saying yeah. that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I remember. He just kept repeating it. Yeah, if I remember right. Yeah. He was, <laughs> was like, you need an overall type guy to come he in. He was actually in my ears and I just repeated what he said. Yeah, me too. That was what I was doing. But Ben Olsen 
changed the vibes first, got Ache Ache on board, not just on board, but leading the train, dragging people along with him. And I think it's hard to evaluate Ben's time in DC. And now this is a new chapter, a new opportunity for him to sort of diversify how he's seen as a coach, as a manager, as a, as a person as well, because he had just been for so long associated with one club. But now this is the second U.S. Open Cup, both of them on the road. Of course, that, you know, to be fair, terrible D.C. team won the other. But there was something truly special about the moment when the whistle blew and Ben just sort of losing it in his own joy and excitement. And I don't think for himself necessarily. I think more so for his players, for the staff for the fans, and there were a good number of Dynamo fans in the building. Shout out to them for traveling. Timothy Holtz hit us up and said, does MLS need to create an MLS Comeback Coach of the Year award just to give it <laughs> to Ben Olsen? I, mean, I, I think he prefers having the the Open Cup trophy, yeah. but like, if there was a Comeback Coach of the Year this year, it would be Ben Olsen. And, uh, I was there 10 years ago when that DC United team, which is the worst regular season team in MLS history, they had three wins all year long, went to utah and beat a really really good rsl side one nil um on the road in the u.s open cup final we and all remember who scored the goal lewis a hey, lewis thank you yeah. miami fc head coach oh wow yeah. um and i think that this is soccer here. that tells a story of who ben olsen is as a coach because that team was terrible and their season was over and they went into a place where they were huge underdogs and they kept fighting and they got themselves a trophy in the midst of all that terribleness. This, I think, tells the story of his evolution as a coach. Because we, over his decade in D.C., there were moments end of 2016, second half of 2018 when they had all those games at home. Remember Chris Pontius was healthy. Right. They played some great soccer, but it, it, was, it, was, nothing, it was nothing like this. Um, we talked about the same soccer brain, right? And that's how they, his biggest job was to get there and to get into Hector Herrera's head and say, hey, th you have to buy in to this. He got Hector Herrera to buy in. You saw the entire team buying in. They're all on the same page. You saw it. You're seeing it with their play. That's all credit to Ben Olsen. So bravo to him. And this is a great job, a great coaching job by him. Even if they didn't win this trophy, what he's done this season, especially here in the second half of the season, it, an amazing coaching job by him all around. Can I just... Sure. I was going to say the soccer brain is big. I also think there was just a level of connection as humans that had been clearly missing within that locker room of oh, like yeah. trust and enjoyment and uh, mutual... We've all been around a training session with Ben Olsen. <laughs> he's like having the most fun. Yeah. He's hitting free kicks. He's trolling everyone. Like it's always a good time around him. He's also very self-aware, which connects with some people and maybe doesn't, but... And he yeah. also sounds like a extra from always sunny in philadelphia which <laughs> yes. just helps yes it really does <laughs> so good um i will sidebar from the happiness for a moment tough week for dc united because some things stayed the same and some things changed and he left and it changed and i think dc is still the same so i think some of the eyes are now shifted off him like you said that he was associated to shifted onto other people who have you know remained dave casper the they shifted onto dave casper and i just think is, the club from the top down yeah Yep, and it should be. Uh, if you're, and in, th in the same way that eyes should be shifted to Toronto because Griff Dorsey scored that goal and has been very good at right back, and Jacob Schaffelberg has been excellent as an attacking winger for a, a pretty good Nashville team. And you know, there's a host of, I mean, Lucas McNaughton, uh, same Nashville team. Uh, you have to have a plan for developing. Richie Larea in, in uh, Vancouver. You have to have a plan for developing young players. Al Ali Ahmed in Vancouver. Yeah. Um, and Toronto haven't, and I, you know, it's one of the first things that went through my head watching Dorsey score that goal. It was like, wow, Toronto could have used that this year or last year or the year before that. Houston are a true playoff contender. There's, there's no doubt about that. Right now, they're in fourth. That would give them home field advantage in the first round, and depending on what the results therein are, could even give them a home game and single elimination after that. It's a successful season. No doubt. They've got to recharge before um, going to Dallas this weekend. And what might they be recharging from? We ask our uh, resident Miami nice. expert, James Harden, yeah. big beard and all, was pretty excited. Yeah. I saw a lot of selfies afterwards. And there's uh, no shortage of places to go celebrate a championship down there. Church? 
yeah, I'm sure that's where uh, where James ended up with his team. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I would I would say that today we're what uh, f- 14 hours, a little more than 14 hours removed from this uh, from winning that title. I'd say they're still recovering from uh, from what was a big night last night. I would say that that's still going on. Uh, shout out, I can't remember who it was that tweeted out a. Um, uh, a list of a lot of places that they could have gone to celebrate <laughs> last night with James Harden in South Florida. So I'm sure they had a good night. Start, start drawing circles. Okay, within Weeby. five miles, we've got this. We go 10 miles away here. If you go right by the airport, you're going to fly out of tomorrow. Where can we go? Do we need to sleep? That's a question you have to Weeby, ask pop quiz for you. What was Orlando City's result in their game after winning the Open Cup? Was it... Year? I'm going to guess it was the, wasn't there a game that the Revs just beat them down? No, that was Atlanta. I don't know. I think they did okay. I think we all built it up and then they, now they got nope. They lost 5-1. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> it, was it was the Revs. I had a little bit of that. The previous, open cup, the previous open cup was way back in 2019. Of course, we all remember Atlanta won that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what was their result the next game? Was that the 7-1 Revs game? No, it was not the 7-1 Revs game. No. It was that was a, the Heinze era. It was a 3-1 loss. Oh, the they lost. It was the DeBoer era, correct. That they lost it. their first two games after winning the Open Cup. The year before that, the Houston win in 2018. They actually won their first game after the Open Cup, but then lost their next four. <laughs> well. Yeah. <laughs> the hangovers of many varieties yes. after U.S. Open Cup uh, championships, apparently. Ah, we'll talk about more of that here in just a second. I want to dig in on the Pat Onstad and roster real quick. We talked about our tour. Are there any other moves that really stand out to you guys that change this? I mean, Ache Ache is the one that just slaps you in the face with like a, you know, a shovel. Who are the other guys here that you're like, okay, that was Steve, under the radar. Great. Steve Clark. And I, I think that one was less under the radar of, of when they made it. I think it made sense, but just getting an MLS veteran who can carry his level and, and do his job. And obviously he didn't start. In the Open Cup final, Andrew Tarbell did, who again is also an MLS veteran, who knows the job, but Steve Clark has been a plus goalkeeper. He's not elite in MLS this year. He's a little bit naturally undersized. We've known that forever, but he's a guy who's played late into the season. He understands the travel, the challenges, the way different teams play, and I think he's been a big part of helping that back line behind Arthur um, sort of solidify, and when you look at the group that has made it happen for them. It hasn't been Teenage Hadebe, who's a designated player, and it hasn't been um, as much MLS veterans. Like, it's been Mikel, who didn't know this. That's team. who I was going to go with, to bring him up from your second team. Yeah. Yep. And all okay. reports in preseason were that he was kind of like, like, well, is this going to be something that he played him can, at left back a bunch? Yeah, that too, he can do consistently, or is he going to be a bit part? And now he's like, this dude's a starter. How about getting Andrew Tarbell for nothing? as the backup goalkeeper and he was in in goal i mean this for is the a whole guy, cup right I mean, yeah, it's cup, yeah the whole cup and this is a guy who won he was in goal in 2020 for the crew right in in mls cup so having that type of depth in goal um he, he he's done a really good job um you know brad smith has been useful more than useful for them uh franco escobar has been very useful. Franco Escobar has won like 17 trophies <laughs> right? in MLS. He won MLS Cup and Supporter Shield last year with LAFC. He won a bunch with Atlanta, and now he wins Open Cup. He must have at least seven or eight. I mean, Bossy is one of those where if you go spin yeah. TAM, like get your money's worth. They've got their money's worth on that as well. I would even say something like uh, Nelson Quinones, who has been disappointing from an attacking output perspective, but has clearly made progress this year and you go back to developing young players we talk about this all the time whether on camera off develop young players he has developed this year would he be better to your point about getting a dp winger doyle as probably a second fiddle or a sub yeah probably but i one of the things i was impressed by outside him scoring a goal sad for him that it got called back it was the right call but i wanted to see him have that moment was the defensive work rate he put in the entire game from the winger spot i mean he was all over deandre yedlin that entire game Yeah, And it's those little things in a final that are going to make the difference. If you can't always be the game changer in the final third, be that. I'll use a guy that could have a huge David Goss bump. Has had a number of good (laughs) chances. Hasn't really finished, but has a profile. I mean, Ache 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 the David David Goss bump. Yeah, Yeah, Ache Ache. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we're going to hit that in uh, just a little bit. So we'll get to that. Um, Yeah, congrats to the Houston Dynamo. What a a night it was for them. Just a really uh, feel-good story. Yeah. 
because we we all remember when the dynamo from 06 to about 2013 or so like legit one of the two best teams in the league and it's good to see them getting back to that level and hopefully it translates in in the city as well best coach that they've had since Tom Kinnear I mean pretty clearly doubt, right yeah without a doubt yeah, like Ted Siegel, the owner, did an interview with Charlie Bohm in WestSoccer.com before this, had a lot of things to say about investment coming in. Um, it seems like they're on the right track. And to see that is is really exciting because I came into this league and got obsessed with this league when Houston was a yeah. a wagon. You know, like yeah. they were they were the team. They were Robertson winning in less cups. Stadium Saturday night. D Row, yeah. Where that was the game. That, that when they opened their current stadium too, it was uh that they put those banners up. I, I was there for that. I remember that. That was Fun times, fun times. Brad, uh, Brad Davis, right? Yeah, Brad oh, Davis. yeah. I love that. Magical anyway, left foot. let's talk about the also Rands, the Forgettables, Inter Miami. No, sorry. <laughs> uh, second place, you know, that's the first time for them. Wait, are we doing executive of the year? Is that an ETR thing or is that a real thing? Uh, I think sporting executive of the year is generally something we do. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't. Those but other Pat awards, Onset and his team are are in that combo. Yeah, for right? sure. Have okay. Those other awards are, you know. I don't you know, I have the validity what, of those given out by this podcast. Well, we're I, so yeah, no we're so tell. legitimate. I forget what's right. quote unquote real. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, Miami. Yeah. What does this mean in the grand scheme of their season? And I mean, like it was the first big disappointing moment, I think, that they've had post yeah, Messi. I, I think big picture, it doesn't mean a lot. They won a trophy, they qualified for CONCACAF Champions Cup already. So there wasn't like, uh, this is your one opportunity if you don't make the playoffs to get into something like that. I think they've had these magical moments in the spotlight where it wasn't also like, everyone's watching the one time. You got to, you know, you have to draw in fans. You have to make everyone into this. Like the League's Cup run, I think, did that. So I think big picture, not a ton. Smaller, uh, this is the worst they've looked since Messi and company have joined. And this was the first time since where they looked similar to the team they were before, which was just a complete lack of ideas in the attack. Zero thrust. Even against Atlanta, they had that. Yeah. yeah. And some of it was like, they got a few lucky bounces, right? Yep. They got a penalty kick. Farias had a ball fault in, but Farias looked like a creator. Campania looked dangerous. Robert Taylor against TFC came off the bench when Messi got hurt and looked like Messi light for 15 minutes against a really bad team. They've had all these moments where, the question has always been, can the defense hold up? Because they're going to score goals with or without Messi. And then in this game, I mean, they weren't on the field in the first half. I don't think they had a shot. No. Not even just a shot on goal. I don't think they had a shot in the first half. And they had Farias on the field. They had Kramaski on the field. Gomez was on the field. They didn't have Jordi Alba. But, like, there was pieces out there that you thought could work. And so I think this was the starkest reminder of, of how reliant they are on the greatest player of all time, but also someone who's played a lot of minutes and is on the other side of that 35 year range, Jordi Alba as well. Um, so I think a lot of that is a little bit sobering for how the team is built or how the team is structured right now and the potential for the rest of this season. I think the team also just looks gassed all around. Right? Yedlin on that first goal, man. And, and then Yedlin, and then Yedlin making that, foul or he gets beat and then has to, comes back around with the wrong foot to make yeah. the to get the penalty for Houston. I just think they looked gassed all around. Um the reports also out of uh, out of Miami uh before that game or uh, the day of the game were that not even the team knew what the lineup was going to be or how they were going to play until the morning of the final. Uh could explain why that first half was god awful. Was probably like you said probably the worst we've seen them uh since Messi and all of the other signings arrived. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't good, I, you know. And I think that this kind of you know opens eyes a little bit as to the fact that where Miami, where Miami still is, and, and they don't have Messi in the lineup, they don't have Alba in the lineup. Yes, they're still a talented roster. Yes, they still have players like like Farias and, and like Kramaski that are good. But it, it, it's it's not going to be as simple, right? It's not going to be as easy as they make it made it seem when they have Messi on the pitch. I think they look. It's He's 36. He's he's has an injury, but we still seen his impact on the pitch when he's there and how much he changes his team, how much confidence he gives them. He gave him some confidence in some in some MLS games, even without him there. It's it's just clearly not the same. Two questions for you, Doyle. Is Messi going to play 
any more this season, and, and what big of a role do you think? This is we're just kind of guessing, predicting. No, no, no. Reading you, this is your expertise. Yeah. <laughs> Two, can Miami make the playoffs without him? Uh, I'll answer the second one first. Yes. Even without Messi and Alba, I thought that just in terms of raw talent, Miami had the better team on the field last night and more depth in terms of raw talent. And I think that will be the case in every game they play for the rest of the season. So even without Messi, they have Charlotte twice. They have Chicago. NYCFC this weekend is tough. Cincinnati is tough. But like they have three games that they should win. And then if you can get a point this weekend and a point against Cincinnati, that probably gets you in. Go ahead. Now, if Cincinnati wins this week, and locks up the and shield. By the way, Lucha's got a knock, so they might be resting him. So things are. Right. So you know. you're saying that's 11 points. That would get them to 43 I, points. That I, would mean Montreal and NYCFC. I think NYCFC does it. Okay. I don't think Montreal do it, given their remaining schedule. Um, DC United aren't convincing anyone. The Red Bulls looked great last week, but like, who knows? <laughs> but that, I mean, yeah, it feels DC. more like a one off. Yeah. They suck you back in <laughs> just when you think you're out. And what was the first question? Messi status Messi the rest of the year. So, would you play him? How about that? How much? How much would you risk? What him? I what I have heard from you know folks in Miami is that he's probably going to be shut down until um, the international break. Uh, that is that is that's the whispers who knows you know they might push back against that we might see him this weekend he like he does not historically miss a lot of time unless um something's really bothering him um i personally if i were making these decisions i would say we don't want you 50 percent because if you come back at 50 percent we get what happened in toronto against toronto which is you play half an hour and then you're gone for two weeks. Let's let's make sure that you're good to go when you're good to go because we have enough. Like if you look at that locker room, uh, there are international players: Spain, Ecuador, Venezuela, Finland, USA. Like they're everywhere. Ukraine, Canada. Like these are not. Like these are not small players from small teams. These are guys who are Finland. very, very good. Yeah. Uh, and so I, th I think if you're Tata, that's the conversation you have with the locker room. Like, look, we, we're going to be without Leo for a couple of weeks, but we have enough. I think big picture, the convo is we won a trophy. We qualified for Champions Cup next year. We need to make sure that you're like you're 36. Right. Yeah. We need to make sure you're healthy for this contract. Yeah. And like these years, like they're going to go to for MLS Cup next year. Right. Even if they make the playoffs and like we can all go back to Sasha questions board and all of this. But this was why it's a lot of games in a short amount of time. You're talking about them being tired. They have two midweeks with games on both sides, like plus all those internationals have to travel to those places and then come back. And, and most play. most of the league did not have to grind out that league's cut month most of the league got to sit back in the cut it does right, put rest. In, what happened last night does put into perspective just how magical that league's yeah. cup run was yeah. absolutely and how worth it was because you got the do like you got you won so you got what it was worth and now you can sort of take things but to me it's like if you're 50 percent, it's not even to toronto it's like if you're 50 percent and, and it gets bad and now you're out six months yeah, that's not none of it was worth it. Oh, and by the way, you have World Cup qualifying happening. And for Stefano's dad, that is the most <laughs> yes. important thing. <laughs> Without a doubt. You got to make sure he's no, good to go. For but that. look, I mean, I think it's it's the guy never had a proper normal break of an offseason yeah. that he's gotten his whole career, which is often an issue for players that come to come MLS in the MLS. summer. He had the World Cup also in between. So he didn't have the usual mm -hmm. La Liga or Liga on like break in the, for Christmas and for, you know, and for uh, for New Year's. And I think the most telling moment was after that Ecuador game where he gets subbed off after get, getting the game winning goal. I don't I, I can't stress this enough. This guy's never said anything to the uh, to the fact of where he, what he said after that game, which was like, yeah, this is probably going to be what's going to be happening with me where I'm going to have to sub out for him to say that is kind of like unheard of. He's never, ever talked about leaving a game. The guy hates being subbed out, does wants to play every single game, every single minute for him to say that. I think it's pretty telling 
but then it comes back and plays against Toronto, which is like, oh man, like that's kind of going against what he just talked about, about maybe not playing every single minute of every single game. That's where you need somebody who knows the league to be like, hey, look, I know, <laughs> I know. Bernadeski <laughs> and Lorenzo Insigne, I know it yeah. seems like a game you want to be a part of, but actually we're going to be good. The thing I think about with all of this is like, would it actually be better? One, to your point, Dave, to shelve him to make sure there's no short, medium, long-term price you pay for this at all. Because his his health, his availability is everything. Put it on all the other guys. Yeah, This is your miracle to pull off. He yep. dragged you to League's Cup, but Messi is 36. He may not be there every game, even when he's 100% as he's bouncing back and forth. Like, you guys want a miracle? You pull it off. Yeah. So the one thing about this team, which we talked about all through the first half of the season and obviously changed when Messi arrived is they didn't have it. They don't have a chance creator. They don't have a 10 and they don't have a fluid enough system to, to create chances without that player. And it was Pasuelo last year. They didn't have it the whole first half of the year. They thought they were going to play two target center forwards together and create half chances just through sheer quality and will. It didn't work. The only guy on the roster who's that guy is Farias. It's a lot to put on a young player who has never played in this league. So it's going to fall. Like, when you talk about that miracle and pulling it out of guys, I mean, Alba's 34. I don't know that he's going to elevate. No, it's it's going to be on specifically far as his shoulders. Maybe Campagna, because he's able to create chances in weird, you know, sort of out of the run of play because of his skill, his size, his physicality. And he he's done a little bit of that for this team. Um, there's not a lot of chance creation in this team all of a sudden from a, from a squad that was like, they're going to score five goals every game and they're going to be rampant. It just shifts things a ton. I also think it's interesting to look now going forward of like, what's the roster built for next year? Is there some way to find some sort of fill-in, or do you build two systems? If they had Gregory and Mota, would you be any any less concerned about that chance? Grade? I think if they had Gregory and Mota, you could not have Arroyo and someone else on your roster. Right, they would have gotten other guys yeah, yeah, right. yeah. mid-season. Well, but I, I, I think David's right. Like It does come down to um Farias he has to be he has to be the one to sort of drive the show and he's shown in he's shown in snippets that he's very very good and if you have Taylor balancing him on the other wing Taylor is not a primary chance creator and that play f- flows through him but he's a very smart player in understanding where the space is going to be and how to attack that space off the ball. And if, when he does that, he can then provide the final ball. So the patterns of play to get to that point, um, look, that's the challenge, man. I also want to point out that Javier Morales, this kid was just signed to, he's not going to play. He's 16 years old, but like, come on. Javi most face on the bench when they were down two nothing. Did you see that on the broadcast? No, oh, he was that. not happy. Not happy. He not happy that. about the state of affairs. Listen, at all. I'd say Kromoski to your point on Taylor is the same sort of player. Yeah. yeah. When yep. you give him the space to attack and run into all of a sudden, he's a, he's a difference maker. But when he's the one trying to generate that space for others, that's not his cup well, of tea. Even like you look at, um, I don't know why this is the team that came to I guess they're playing them this weekend. When you look at NYCFC, they scored three against Toronto. That's great. But you look at their attack, it's four kids mm-hmm. a lot of the time. And there are moments where it's like, hm, there's not really an adult in the room. There's not really someone to be like, this now should be serious and we should score. And that's where like Messi comes in and Kramaski can be what he is off of that. But he's 18. It's his first year of playing full-time professional soccer. Like, yeah, he's not going to carry them. Weekend and week, they're not going to go midweek on the road, and then he's coming home on the weekend and like carrying them both times. So it's not really how this roster is built out. They don't have an Amin Bossy. Come on, gotta have an Amin Bossy. You gotta have an Amin Bossy. If you're I mean, if you have an Amin Bossy, you've got a trophy. If LAFC had an Amin Bossy, they oh. probably would have won some more trophies because that guy's a PK. Uh, speaking of the trophy da- draft, we've been promising ourselves an update. I don't know if anybody else cares about this, just like <laughs> the Golden Boot draft. But here's the standings as currently uh, constructed. David Goss, one trophy, the U.S. Open Cup, Houston Dynamo, oh, H-Town, Dynamo. stand up. Oh, and oh, Dynamo. you also cornered the market on the wooden spoon, Dave. You have both Toronto FC and Colorado. So you're definitely going to get up. I always believed in both. Of to you. two trophies. <laughs> Meanwhile. Me and Ralph Priest uh, yeah. just playing the games. <laughs> yeah, wow. Uh, Doyle, you've got one trophy, Vancouver Whitecaps, but... You've also got FC Cincinnati, who you took straight off the jump, who will win the Shield. I mm-hmm. think that's sure. So you'll be at two as well. I've got one trophy, of course, Inter-Miami 
got me the League's Cup. Could not get it done in the U.S. Open Cup. Alas, I have the Philadelphia so Union. A, last night was a big swing for Was, him. yeah. Uh, but I have the Union, so that's like a guaranteed MLS Cup for me. <laughs> so it should be good with that one. Uh, yeah, and Tom Bogert. Tommy. The fighting Dr. Scoops. Just Nelson Muntz-esque. Ha ha. LAFC, three chances, zero Break, trophies. Breaking news. Tom Bogart, zero trophies. Zero trophies. <laughs> I'm hearing reports. Well, he is a, he's a Liverpool guy, yeah. so it's, he knows uh, what he's looking at. No way he's going to get the double. He, you know what? He might get the golden boot draft, which we'll see in a second. No way he's getting the double. Let's just quickly list off from this list of teams we drafted who are actual MLS Cup contenders. Union, I would say yes. So yep. you have them. I have so, the all right, I'm going gonna, gonna to do the list. Weeby has the Union, Montreal, Austin, Sporting, nope. Charlotte, nope. RSL, nope. and Inter-Miami. Maybe? I think the Union are clear MLS Cup contenders. If Miami make it to the playoffs, they are MLS Cup contenders as well. If Messi's healthy, clear. If Messi's not healthy, right. murkier. Much murkier. Waters. There I, I, I'm so I'm, you know, my odds are not MD good. What does MD mean on this? Huh? What does MD mean? Matt Doyle. That's Matt Doyle approved contention status. Oh, oh right. got it. As all the right. arbiter of the team. I thought he had all the. I'm like, how did Doyle get into Miami in the last 30 <laughs> seconds? Tom, uh, Tom's team, LAFC, um, they are MLS Cup contenders, yes. very obviously. Galaxy, no. Fire, no. Columbus, yes. Very clear, yes. Portland Timbers, I yes. wavered on them. So are we saying yes. that the, the Timbers are actual MLS Cup contenders? They are going to have a I have a hard time game saying no. Really? Given the Timbers' history in this competition and the way that they have begun to play, yes. Stefano, they look so much better. But I don't think that they're that they're. I don't think they're built to make a full run at LMLS Cup. So I'm gonna right. say no. How about the Revs? Uh, yes, but I don't believe. I'm gonna say yes. I think I still think that they have enough. I mean, you guys just in a vacuum right now, you would choose the Revs as a higher percentage of winning MLS Cup than the Portland Timbers. No, I would not. I actually wouldn't. Uh, yeah, I do. I, I, okay. I liked them at the beginning of the season. Granted, everything that's happened, I still think they have a roster. Everything that's about. happened, and I think a better conference. Also, that's no, the other part. Georgie's yeah. gone. Yeah. yeah. Like, th yeah. That, that might be no, outside we of the Brandon Bosch League play yet. Brandon By. Right. Brandon By her. Brandon By. This new, like, the, again, they made Jonathan Dean look like Cafu last week with this new tactical system that Clint PA is. I, I don't have the Revs as MLS yeah. okay. contenders. All right. Uh, and Minnesota is his final team. I think we all agree that's a no. Uh, David Goss has Toronto FC. <laughs> that's a no. Uh, <laughs> Seattle Sounders. I, I have them as a yes. FC Dallas, to me, that's a no. Red Bulls, that's a no. Atlanta United, that's a no. But I didn't feel great about it. I feel better about Atlanta getting the, the Doyle stamp of approval than Portland and New England. Same. Same there. I, I believe more in Atlanta. With the roster, I, currently so has. I do too. But it like, remember the goal they gave up to Miami in League's Cup, where it was, where it was was Busquets all by himself yes. with nobody pressing him for five minutes, and so Messi just runs over the top. I thought it was pretty Mayumba. Yeah, that right? was. Pretty... They gave up that exact same goal this weekend <laughs> to Montreal. Ouch! And they gave up that exact same goal two weeks ago to Bernard Camungo. Right, is it like this is not you, you do Camungo not no out. like these guys are good players, but you do not have to be the greatest soccer player of all time to score this goal. Fair enough. And Atlanta's playing much better soccer than they were, and they could go out there and win. I think a lot of games four to two, but you don't four two your way to MLS Cup. And I just like I lean towards teams that can lock it down. This is, but you know what? I'm looking at your list here, and you are just slapping MD on all your teams. <laughs> anyway, let me finish. Let me let me finish. Stuff. Let me finish. David's. Uh, so it's Dallas. No, Red Bulls. No, Atlanta United. Maybe Dynamo. Do we consider Dynamo to be threats to win MLS? Percent. Wow. How can you not? I just don't think they can do the double. Nate, I so fair. But that's, but, just, playing, that's Western... just playing the odds there. If you're just yeah. like, oh, they're not going to do the double. Didn't we just talk about how wiped out and exhausted Inter-Miami are? They're not going to be playing wiped out and exhausted teams. To me, the they're in, to me, they're in the same segment as like the Revs, for instance. Of So the maybes. The Revs, yeah, Portland, like They have clear Atlanta. flaws. You understand the flaws that they have. And, and But you also know that at the very sort of peak of their abilities, which in the playoffs, really, it's about hitting momentum having form and not being hurt that they could do it. And the nice thing about these playoffs is once you get to the first round, you also have a break. So if you're a 
you know, a less deep team like I think the Dynamo are. Mm -hmm. If you had injuries, if you had an issue. Dynamo are also, they're a rhythm team. Look, I, I put them in the maybe category. But they're in rhythm. Yeah, but they're a rhythm team that's confident and in rhythm. And then one, get, but now they had a night out. Off. And now they had a night they out. They were definitely in rhythm. <laughs> all over. James had them in rhythm last night. Oh no yeah, <laughs> they were feeling the Miami rhythm. And I, David's David's last pick was the Rapids, which was obviously a good pick because that got him half a trophy. My teams are FC Cincinnati, yes. very obvious contenders. Vancouver Whitecaps. I would I would put them in the same maybe category that you're talking okay. about with these other teams. Orlando City. Yeah, they're a contender. Okay. Right? Yeah. Stefano? Yeah, I think they're, yes, I would put them in. DC United, absolutely no. not. NYCFC, no. 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 San Jose, no. Uh -uh. And Nashville, I have Nashville as a contender. If you have Nashville as a contender, then Houston is a contender. Agreed. They've both gone to cup finals. One won, one didn't. I don't They've know. Shown that ability. That. I don't know about They both that. have clear, distinct styles. There's a gap between Nashville and Houston. In some. Pretty key areas of the field. Center back. Nashville starts center back. Lucas McNaughton half the time <laughs> and me in <and> goal. <laughs> Are you crazy that there's. I get Honey Mukhtar is an MVP. Who else is Lucas a Lucas McNaughton talent? has been really good. Dax, Dax McCarty. We just talked about Archer. Coco Karaskia is better than any of the center, including Annabelle Godoy, who he's national teammates with, who's been phenomenal for Nashville and is good again. Coco Karaskia is a better player than him. Ache Ache is better than all of them. That's fair. Yes. So, like, what are we talking about? And Hani Mukhtar is better than Ache Ache. Hani Mukhtar is a difference maker, and I think it's fair to say that he's a but, goal scorer okay. in a playoff Here's series. What I'll say. Where that Here's helps. what I'll say then. Also, Maybe we do I'll... the Nashville will make a run every year. That's fair. And they just did in Leagues Cup. Different tournament. I, I think... and, and they've looked really bad ever since. Since then. Yeah, if we're talking oh, about... Oh, whoa! We're talking a little hangover. Anti -mode. Just a little hangover. Yeah. <laughs> There's no momentum. Yeah, I don't know. I, uh, I, I guess I just say Nashville. I look at the back line. I look at the way that they can many times play games on their terms, even if we don't like the terms, and it's they not that fun to watch. Galaxy last year in the playoffs because they had zero. Dude, what I'm saying is that I had pretty Sam Surridge, Surridge is the coming. best draft. Nice. Yeah, that's what, that was. This, <laughs> so this, and this is long... the one. This is the one I was really trying. Like I was really concentrating on the trophy draft, not the Golden Boot draft. I didn't take that seriously. Otherwise, right. I would have right, won right, that right. one. Oh, so I'm gonna win no this So they're saying the tiebreaker for the go uh, the trophy because we might be equal is whoever has a better golden boot team. You know that I could also be equal here. Because <laughs> you've got to be a five-tool player. Excuse me. It's possible that the union could win, and I would have You know who's this. not going to be equal? Tom, Tom Boger. No, no chance. No chance. So the tiebreaker, not good for him in this I, case. I try to defend you here, Tom. It's not. Anders has St. Louis City. I would categorize them. You categorize them as a contender? True yes. contender? They yeah. are the number one team in the West. Yeah, I'm just making sure. Is that there's his been some, only there's contender? There's been some people slandering them on this show. Is that his only contender? Oh, he's only, the got only one team. team. Got. Yeah, because oh. we all had an equal amount of teams, and then I, mean, I don't know why we didn't draft St. Louis. That seems like a we all picked them to I mean, be last. Yeah, in the West yeah but in this competition, the wooden spoon oh, is interesting, critical. That's so I don't point. know. Uh, on another note, uh, similar to this, Concacaf Champions Cup qualification. We what if Anders beats Tom with one? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that is actually what we need. Oh, and now I we're all St. Louis City fans on this Let's show. Go. Go City. <laughs> also, you know, Kalen's gonna end up being Anders Kalen team trophy. Seven, draft. Yeah, seventy-two Tom, point Tom font on St. Louis City right now. Uh, Champions Cup qualifiers. The field is expanding significantly. Significantly, and because of MLS just hoovering up spots in Leagues Cup, it's going to be a big crop in 2024. Houston Dynamo are in Open Cup, Vancouver Whitecaps in Canadian Championship, Leagues Cup, Inter Miami, Nashville, Philly, Supporter Shield, Cincinnati. We're just putting a lot of teams I drafted in yeah. the Golden Boot oh, Trap yeah, there, okay. or oh, the Golden yeah, Boot yeah, the Trophy yeah. Trap. Uh, St. Louis City is going to finish top of the West. In either way, they'll get in because the next two in the Shields, the top four in the Shield, will get it. Right now, that'll be Orlando City and Columbus, but Atlanta and New England are still right there on 49 points, and maybe Seattle and LAFC could jump up. Man, LAFC points. are going to have gone to two finals and a semifinal already this year and not qualify. Well, they're not champions. No, I get that. That's wild. There's yeah. our segue. All right. Ah, uh, boy. Uh, one shout-out before we move on. I want to shout-out Grant Peterson who sent us a spreadsheet. He has been keeping track of our golden boot standings all year long. This is an incredible color-coded spreadsheet it has clearly been treated with love and care. And he has the numbers before midweek. I don't think anybody got midweek goals. So I think we're good there. 
83 for the fight in Kalen Toms to 80 for David Goss. So it's a three point gap, according to Grant Peterson. And no Anders says Brian he's going to check White, these numbers, but I trust Grant. Draft? No. I trust Grant. And no one picked Klaus. I still think that was. I picked Klaus. Did you? Mm hmm. In the midseason draft? I had Klaus from the start. I think oh. I took him in the seventh round. I asked Anders if I could take Klaus. The, the other best part about this uh, spreadsheet, by the way, is there's a hidden column that just says Goss Theorem. Yeah. Has Rigoni. This is uh, no, the second not. one's the best one. Yeah. Chicago Fire. <laughs> was well, you know what? Pre-Leagues Cup, it was on its way. Yeah. Post-Leagues Cup, no. Not so much. But Achi it wasn't Achi. Goss Theorem reasons. It was like Kai Kamara. Right. He's not new to this league yeah. who's getting adjusted. Ache Ache was a hit. I'm assuming yeah. that we said these things. We say so much, I forget. Luquinas. Nope. Ah. Giacomo Vrioni. I don't think that's a hit, but I don't think it's a, you know, it's not a swing and a miss. Yeah. So, All right, another cup. Campeones Cup. LAFC, zero. Tigres, zero. Tigres win. In penalties, LA have lost their third final to a Liga MX team twice in CONCACAF Champions League to, of course, Tigres in I that one-off game say, in Orlando. I, I got to say, is it MLS and my own? It was hard to watch T Grace go into Club Leon Stadium and win a trophy like that. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we gotta got get the close up on Doyle's face when he starts you know, he starts in on something like that. Uh and then of course they lose Campeones Cup to T Grace. Anything he takes from the game? Seems like Nahu was on his on his ish Not once again. An entertainer. Did I Always. see a book? Did I it. see a video of him catching a water bottle thrown from the crowd, which <laughs> you should not do. Don't throw anything on the field again. But not who the magic man. He just had this wild moment right before the shootout where he like him and Maxime Carpeau had this like friendly interaction and it ends. And then Max flips out where it's like not who in a friendly embrace still riled up the other team. And it Wait, started it was with Carpeau. I'm not going to lie. I fell asleep. Yeah. Carpeau had been subbed out like right at the end of the game. Right. So that John McCarthy could come on and, and be in the penalties. And then the Wait, final whistle blows. So now who was seeding discontent with the goalkeeper that had just been subbed oh, off. Yeah. He, he walked off the field and like walked the Tigres bench was on the other side from the goal he was in and Crepo was on the near sideline and he came by and they embraced and I think they were talking about the goal that got called back or something. They embraced, they chatted, he walks away and then Max, like he turns, he clearly turns and says something, Max flips and all of a sudden, coaches are holding people back, players are like everyone's falling over Drop, dropped the bomb right before and he was also part of the whole his whole thing because the referee had to go get now who to go to go and get in goal like he was delaying the process he was doing his thing he was doing his antics well and he clearly pissed someone off right at the end he threw one little bomb out <laughs> to get everybody <laughs> pissed off on that bench and it was funny i think we ha there's a whole commercial about it but yeah. Ilya sanchez scores and on his like follow through runs at Nahu and screams at him yeah. on scoring upon but, scoring. Like, Ilya is just, probably not the guy you would predict. No, he is like the calmest person. Very like, mild man. Sometimes you don't even know the so. game's happening when you look at him. Like hair's perfect. He's chilling. It was, it was obviously it's what we've, we've come to know. And um, it was funny watching a lot of these Tigers players take pictures of the trophy after it's like, Guido, where you're like, bro, this is like your 300th trophy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you what do you do with all these photos? Um, I think uh, I said to you, if you asked someone to write the script of what this game would be 24 hours ago before it happened, it would have been LAFC has more of the chances. They're not dominant. Tigres scores on a counter and wins. It wasn't that. It was close. Gignac was an inch away. And then uh, Tigres won in penalties. It felt very much like the LAFC team we've watched over the course of this year, 2023, when you talk about CCL final, when you talk about the League's Cup semifinal, uh, Buanga's arguably the best player on the field. There's some really fun moments. Uh, Olivero was pretty good in moments in this game. They don't have multiple ways to break you down. They're, they're just waiting for Buanga to get half a step on you, for you to be out of position on him. Otherwise, it's a moment of brilliance from Vela that doesn't really come anymore. And a team that plays halfway in, halfway out of they don't know exactly where they want the game to be played. And it's a lot of like mid block and Tigris doesn't care. Right. These guys are vets. They're like, you can have the Tigris ball. Tigris is whole happy game. when the game's mid block. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't what matter to them. And Tigris wasn't dangerous, but it just it, it, everything we've talked about struggles for LFC this season once again came to fruition. Let me uh, 
Let's replay a conversation that was had after the CONCACAF Champions League final against Leon. Steve Trundolo was making this same point then. This is the quote from Trundolo afterwards. Quote, though all the competitions we've been in, excuse me, through all the competitions we've been in this year, for any team that's going to do that next year, I can tell you, the rules and regulations of MLS roster building are not ample enough and we're not equipped enough for all these competitions. I think we have done an incredible job to stay in all the competitions very late, but our guys are depleted. Our stadium ops is tired. Everyone in the organization is tired. Maybe it's too many games or we don't have enough people to cover all these games. And I think moving forward to create a competitive advantage for MLS, I do think the owners, the commissioner, the rest of the league office needs to sit down and come up with solutions because status quo is not going to work. I do know that. And I can tell you that is the opinion of other coaches as well. I will say that he is not wrong. I think that MLS by and large has passed most of Liga MX. I think that Tigres, Monterey, and Club America are consistently a level or two above even the best teams in MLS. And other Club Leon, Pachuca, every now and again. Not small teams like Pumas, but like... <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's for Maria. Uh, the, certain teams can join them for a, you know a tournament or two, but it's always those three. And you know those to catch those three teams... What we have now, it's probably not going to be enough. Uh, so I don't, I don't think Toronto was wrong. I don't think that necessarily absolves LAFC from pretty disappointing performances in three, well, four if you want to count Leagues Cup, crunch games against Liga MX teams this year. They lost both legs to Club Leon. They lost in spectacular fashion to Monterey and as David said they never had any kind of plan B to to threaten Tigris and you know they they have a lot of good honest two-way central midfielders none of them break lines with the ball Vela is not a dynamic winger anymore but you use him as a false nine um so it's like there needs to be a lot of moving pieces to get him into spots where he can be telling. I almost think that they should just go to a, a, a four, two, three, one, you know, play Elie and Acosta or Tillman or Bogush is a double pivot. Let, let Vela be Reynoso, right? Let him be for LASC, what Reynoso is for Minnesota. And you have Boanga on one side and Oliveira, who I like a ton on the other side. And then you put a real number nine up top. They went out and they got Mario uh, Gonzalez this summer and he's looked pretty good um that might be the band-aid for the rest of i don't think trundolo would do it that might be the band-aid for the rest of the year it might how be how you get enough creativity and enough attack out there to turn some of these heartbreakers into wins um but like long term i, I don't think steve trundolo is wrong and i well, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I haven't hey. heard anything about roster rules, but it's it, like the U22 initiative has been such a massive success over the past few years. It's hard to think that we wouldn't be building upon that. So Trundle's right. And the numbers bear it out of like when you look at Tigress's transfers, oh, yeah. they're different than MLS. As you said, there are a few outliers. There are, there are, backs, but MLS teams have spent eight figures, so 10 million or more, I, and I think seven players total in the history of the league. Tigres, Monterey, and Club America have spent eight figures on tw twice as many players as that just in the past, like, six windows. And the other part of that, I think, is in Liga MX in general, there's then a trickle-down, which is some guys don't make it, then... They go to Atlas. The and dude who's tearing to, it up for Mazatlan was yeah. a failure at Club America. You go to Leon, where in MLS, Brian Rodriguez doesn't make it. He goes to Club America. So, like, there isn't as many pieces in the MLS pool to move down. But... Well, that goes to the fact that there's no transfer. There's no transfers between MLS yeah. teams where it's like, if you could just sell Brian Rodriguez for, you know... Anyway, go ahead. Um, they made it to all these finals. And... If I'm looking at it from the outside, which is tough to say with MLS teams, they have two designated players and two under 22 initiative players. They haven't used every avenue to improve their team at its max. So you're complaining about the structure, but yet you're not maximizing within that. 
you flipped your entire MLS Cup roster. Yep. You talk about not having line breaking, passing, not having, you know, game changers. Jose C. Fuentes, they didn't replace. Maxime Cripo got hurt. They went into a CCL final and started John McCarthy. It's like a lifelong backup in Major League Soccer, and it hurt them. You look at other parts of this team. Mario Gonzalez wasn't signed until the summer. Yeah, They didn't have a center forward that they believed in at the CCL final. That's not a requirement in the MLS structure. Right? You lost. You, you sold Chicho Arango. You, can repl- you could have replaced him in the winter. So Steve Trollno is right, which means the margins are thinner for LAFC. And that's what they've come up against, which is a penalty kick shootout, an aggregate goal loss. What was Monterey? They lost 1-0? 3-2. They were up 2-0. They, they up lost 3. Right. So a one-goal loss in totality across three massive games that could have led to two or three trophies. That's how tight it is. That margin is tighter for LAFC than it is for Tigres, who can bring in Diego Lainez, and if he's fine or good, they can also bring in Marcelo Flores and also bring in Sergio Cordova and also bring in Quinone. Like, there's more there. But LAFC have not maximized over the last few years to win these trophies specifically. And I think that part is a little bit deflecting in these big moments. And Anders has paid me to say it also just shows how special that Sounders team oh, was. <laughs> but, but, you know, to the point of this this particular Sounders team, sometimes the stars that got you there before age become less effective and sometimes you can hold on too long. I'm not saying they've held on to Carlos Vela too long, but that that year extension was a year that you didn't have another Denny Bawanga in to integrate and to bring up to this level for both your short, medium, and long term. Love Carlos Vela. His legacy in this league, unbelievable. The most fun player to watch, bar none, in that record-breaking season that I've ever seen in Major League Soccer. I mean, it was completely intoxicating. We are less intoxicated now. And that's natural. But like when they made the decision to stick with that, that was... To your point about, hey, if you could have done this, then this, like there was an alternative to that, right? And I know that would have been a risk. It might have not worked out as well, but it also, I think, lowered their ceiling just that little bit. And you talk about CCL. They brought in Christian Teo and Bale last year. Teo on a DP contract, Bale on a TAM contract. That was supposed to elevate. Teo was supposed to come down. Neither of them are on the roster. So what they did at the end of 2022 didn't help them for 2023, which is if you're going to have Vela, Fine, bring someone else Which, in. You know, in some ways, I'm okay with that. You won MLS Cup. You you created this moment within your club's history yeah. that is Fair. is unforgettable, and that many teams would trade much more to do. I mean, there's but we're not talking about many teams. We're talking about an LAFC team that wants to be at the very very top of not just Major League Soccer but the continent and and beyond. You know, that's why you want to win CCL or Champions Cup. You want to go take your wares to the rest of the world. It didn't get didn't happen for them. But we're always a uh, Curious to see what you think about about where the league is going. I mean, that's what we're here to talk about. And speaking of another league, where they're going, they're going to the playoffs, MLS Next Pro. And they're drafting opponents, Dave. MLS Next Pro playoffs start this weekend, Friday through Sunday on MLS Season Pass on Apple TV. I repeat, they are live, not live. Well, that was live. It just wasn't live streamed. They're drafting their playoff opponents. Benny Failhaber said, scared money, don't make money, (laughs) and then drafted the highest possible opponent to play to come to Kansas City. That is legendary maybe unwise but legendary are you surprised though no like benny and Not ike like are the two coaches at skc too i think you'd believe in them to be like yeah we'll take it right should they do this in mls because watching the the live stream of luch von and Steel, like falling over in his chair being like oh my god i thought i was going to be drafted now we get to host a home yeah. game and specifically said i have to go cancel one-liners. my coach bus yeah. <laughs> right because i already said, booked it to come yeah. to kc so i kind of want to see this in mls like yeah. People people would laugh at us probably, but yes. that's okay because it would be awesome. Well, isn't that the point of Next Pro? Test this stuff out. Yeah, yeah, so you're yeah in. for sure. What in conference, cross conference? Do you change everything? No, the, you're doing the, 14 tro- tournaments. I now struggle with if, with MLS. I struggle with drafting it off the jump. I almost feel like you know the regular season, the way it all finishes, has to set you up for for some part of the playoffs. I sort of feel like it's like if you get through that first round and you're still the highest seed remaining, why couldn't you draft your next opponent? Why does it have to be straight bracket? I mean, the regular season can set you up for the playoffs in terms of set you up to have the first pick. So that if you're in the playoffs and you you know, you have the number one record and Montreal make the playoffs and Montreal's terrible on the road, you're like we select CF Montreal. I don't know. I just think there's something in And then here. like you you hit you you set the bracket from that and then the bracket's immutable at that point. 
either oh. way. Interesting. So you make the picks. Oh, okay. That's your advantage. Is that you? Yeah. You're, yeah. So you get a you get that built in advantage. We're yeah. gonna find out though if there is any advantage because we don't know if like you picking an it's, opponent. The whole thing is just bulletin board yeah. material. It's of like ridiculous. every team that gets picked wins on the road. Which to open this. I mean, thing I'm up. just here for you know the event. You have all the coaches. It's almost like you know it's like the NBA lottery. You have all the coaches. That coach has to get up there, look across the room at his opponent, and be like, I choose you. We want you. We think we can beat you. What's the uh, best matchup in the most next pro playoffs? What are you looking at? Um, it's going to be really fun. I think, obviously, SKC Austin. Like, Austin's the best defense in the league. They play high possession style as well, and SKC chose them, which was a bold move. And then I think you go to that bulletin board material and all that, and then out west as well, Tacoma and Houston. That was like an epic game last year in the playoffs and so you come back again i think tacoma is one of the best top to bottom rosters they've got multiple players that were up for mvp and i think sissoko was best 11 as well josh tensio's played in that group and been really good so i i think in the west those are the ones that are exciting and then in the east it's columbus orlando orlando is the third best attack and the fifth worst defense in the league they like i covered their game three not an oscar pareja team they they lost the crown legacy six to three at home so, that's and that's against Columbus now. Yeah. Right. Which is playing exactly like a Wilfred Nance team. They are playing. Who's the coach for Columbus? It is Lawrence Courtois. I oh, all right. So. Yeah. yeah. Is that the right name? He was the coach last yeah, year. Courtois. Yeah. yeah. Um, they play fullbacks as center backs. They play center forwards as tens. Ah. They don't really play. No one touch, guys. all two or three touch. It's just yeah. a word. I love it. Yeah. Uh, they, um, Total football. they have their goalkeeper comes out in possession pass sometimes center backs yes. to help give them another option to play across the back line so like that's the game where you're like this game and what's fun i think about next bro is like these teams are going to stick to their fundamentals I, the point of benny fellab or choosing austin is like you want your young players to be tested you want to test them in high leverage situations you want to do it in front of a home crowd if you can to have that moment and that experience but like you want to push players so these teams are going to stick to who they are and i think that's going to lead to like wild open games uh, in this opening round. And then in the next round, the one seeds who each had a bye, who were massively better than everyone else, Crown Legacy in Colorado, they're going to get to pick again. So then oh, they're nice. going to get to pick oh. of everyone left who they want, and then the top <laughs> seed left will pick the other game. It's utter chaos. So there's a second it. draft coming. Uh, I can tell you right now, this is not too complicated. It's it's just the right amount of complicated, maybe. But perfect for MLS Next Pro. Should be fun. MLS season pass on Apple TV. I'm just going to say the best place to develop young people, obviously, Rock Chalk Park. Where sporting KC play. I'm just yeah. saying. So. Uh, That's where my soccer one, journalism one more question. career started. Is there one young domestic player in Canadian and American um, that the fans should be aware of playing that you expect to take the field in these games? Um, and I put you on the spot. You here, put me so on I the thought. spot, and I can't think of anyone. Is Jason Russell Rowe right still now. playing no. for? He's still That's not made the big jump. Yeah. You you yeah. think on it? We'll hit you in the mailbag. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Match day 35. Go over here. Paul Rothrock, but he's not that young. Yeah, he's like 23. Tacoma, but he's been really good, and he's been really fun. Okay. Match day David 35 Paramba. is here. I got you. All right. All right. <laughs> Match day 35 is here. Of course, playoff implications everywhere, whether it be seeding or just playoff lives at stake around the lines. Uh, well, here's some games to watch. Here's one we won't talk about. Out of one. Oh, okay. Can you you going to say it? Or? CJ only. Okay. From oh, Philadelphia. I've been hearing about that kid for years. He's still only like 16 or 17. Oh my God. Yeah. But he's like second in the league in assist. He, it's, it's very Jack McGlynn of like, he's maybe he shouldn't be at Philly because he's oh, a great right. soccer player. Okay. But then it's like, well, now you're a great soccer player who knows how to press and you could play anywhere and do anything. And he plays on the side of the diamond. And the kid, the goal scorer for NYCFC, MD Myers, mm -hmm. he's a Philly Academy kid though, right? Back in the day. But Back he's like 23 now. So they, they released him from the Academy. He went to college. Right. He went to Rutgers. Yeah. He yeah, went to my hands. We're gonna circle High back. Point first. I'm going to take this offline. And then he transferred to Rutgers. Okay. Thank you. Is, Thank he, you. is he like Match a good day 35 <laughs> is here. Yeah. There are a lot of playoff implications. Uh, New York Red Bulls hosting Chicago okay, Fire. Terrible. This is a battle royale for respectability. May, neither side may come out with it, but uh, we're not going to talk about this one any more than that. There are MLS uh, game previews on season pass and dave you and i dug into this one so we'll just skip right over that dynamo and dallas this could decide copa tejas i say could because if it's a draw austin will keep it for the second straight year but if there's a winner the winner will take I think copa austin tejas. fans show up to this game and like cheer for a tie 
that show up to the parking lot? Yeah. Like they did last yeah. year? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know. Raph hit us up. Hey, Mr. Weeby, got an extra time topic for all of y'all. Well, y'all, big fan of the show, by the way. FC Dallas has had a string of good results against some of the East top teams. Have not one, but two difference makers in Jesus Ferrer and Alan Velasco. By the way, Velasco with a banger last night in a draw against Philly and keep games really tight. So it feels like they always have a chance to grab a win. Am I delusional for thinking they're a dark horse for MLS cup or at least a deep playoff run? Stefano, what do you think? Delusion or reality? Uh, I want to say it's a reality, You're but saying I'm going to say delusion. That hesitation was yeah, delusion. definitely delusion. I don't think that they can make a big run. I mean, look, they got some great players, but it's just they're so inconsistent. You don't yeah. know what you're going to get on any given day. I mean, they got a great result, you know, with a rotated squad uh, midweek. They, they get a draw in Phillies before going to this game against Houston in a rivalry matchup. So give them a little hope there. But I think long term, uh, yeah, delusion as far as an MLS Cup run. Yeah, what I will say is that they'll be in games and in a first round that awards you a win for a penalty kick shootout out of right. after regulation. That, that's not a bad recipe, but they're certainly not a favorite. Could it happen? Sure. Sure, it could happen. Uh, St. Louis City hosting Sporting Kansas City. Tim hit us up, said, first of all, absolutely love the podcast. See, we need these in reviews. iTunes review. Uh, our emails iTunes. are full of love. <laughs> and look forward to listening to you guys twice a week. I'm a new MLS in St. Louis City fan, and I've got my three kids excited about the team, too. I managed to get us tickets to an Open Cup match, and we have been hooked since then. Even his wife is saying it's the best sporting event she's ever been to. About Seattle, uh, excuse me, about St. Louis, Sporting Kansas City Derby. How could it be called anything except the show me Derby? Two cities on opposite sides of the show me state. Plus, I can't think of a better term to describe what a Derby game is all about except show me. I so, like that. I think man, it's really good. I was going like to say, because show me state is Missouri. But sporting stadiums in Kansas. Well, but it's a weird Kansas City like, thing. We can all deal with it. You, all right, I was gonna say, what do Kansas you're, City people say? What do you mean? Like, are they Missouri or Kansas? Uh, we just don't delineate, really. It's like just the Kansas Chiefs are in city. Missouri, but like... The whole metro oh, I didn't area. I realize the Chiefs are in Missouri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're in Missouri. Oh, so I, are the Royals. Right. But so as a Kansan, calling Sporting KC versus St. Louis City the show me Derby would not offend you. you no, would, no, You would no, embrace no. it. I think it's okay. And the other thing is, look, both these cities are are split, too. Like St. Louis is Can you text Illinois your buddy Seth Sinovic and see what Missouri. he says? Because He's on the Missouri side. You know, right, but he, he, but he played on well. the Kansas side. Well, no, he went to Rockhurst. So, Well, I guess he, but then, you know. There's a lot going on. Can here. you imagine like New York and New Jersey being this cool about like, oh yeah, it's fine. It's in the other state, but it's fine. I, yeah, no, I just think, fly that I think there's here. some people said like the Darby Q and like that's a little too clever for my liking. A little too. I clever. like that. I mean, it's what is the Missouri? You sound like Bob bagging on El Trafico. Yeah. Border war. Border war. Yeah, I don't like that as much. Yeah, but that, that's, that's, that's Jayhawks Tigers. That's tickets. Oh, it's already yeah. exists. Right. It already exists. Yeah, right. Yeah. right. And they both are in Missouri, so it's not really the same. But I guess it would are they work back in the same conference? Borders. No, we own them from afar, <laughs> right, Anders? Uh, anyway, that's an so, interesting one. Vonder James, why is goals minus XG treated as indicative of goalkeeper skill when measured for goalkeepers? Berkey's MVP case uh, is a good example, but treated as evidence of luck when measured for an entire team over the course of a season. For example, Austin regressing to the mean between twenty twenty two and twenty three, or you could even put St. Louis City's. Um, goal scoring output this year compared to XG. So traditionally, keepers also regress to the mean. Like I would not expect Berkey to have this season again next year. And if you look at his last few years in the Bundesliga, he was actually kind of a below average shot stopper. What made Matt Turner, uh, Georgi Petrovic, and uh, to a lesser extent, Andre Blake so special is that they were able to keep that high goals minus expected goals level year after year after year there had no there had been nobody in mls history no goalkeeper in mls history who did what matt turner did over four years from 2018 to 2022 just nobody had done it um even blake had a real off year in 2020 remarkable in 21 and 22 only very good this year so even among the greats there is some uh variation so when you cite goals minus expected goals as for a goalkeeper in a one season sample size you're basically saying like he was on one like he was he was just really locked in and you don't expect it to um you expect regression to the mean and with st louis city just like austin last year i do expect some regression to the mean in in 2024 unless the game model changes somewhat uh or maybe they get 
you know, they're, they're another team that really hasn't, like I was surprised they didn't go out this summer and they added another, you know, add another DP or anything. So um, maybe they get new personnel to change it a little bit and give up fewer big chances and ask less of their goalkeeper. Um, but just traditionally the way, well, the way I use that stat on an individual level for goalkeepers, I'm just looking at like, like how is this guy doing? Is he saving the shots he should save? Is he saving a couple every other game? One that he shouldn't save that saves his team goal? In Roman Burke's case, the answer is emphatic yes. And then I look at it structurally from a team-wide point of view. It's like, are they doing the things that they need to do to limit the quality chances they give up and to generate uh, a preponderance of quality chances going the other direction? St. Louis are doing a good job in um, generating a ton of quality chances. Uh, they are not doing as good a job uh, at limiting those chances. Hence, Roman Berkey, he's been on one. He deserves to be in the MVP race. I think an award is different than we expect it next year. Yep. Like nobody's taken away from what Berkey's done this right. year or St. Louis this year and saying, hey, that was luck. It's just saying, hey, in moments where it was like the odds said you didn't finish, you met the moment, yep. but that doesn't mean that that extends. And I mean, Andre Blake is a great example of it. Andre Blake is like, he's having a good to very good year this year. That doesn't mean he wasn't the goalkeeper of the year last year. You know, he, he was awesome last year. I mean, you could, Georgie Petrovich had a, an argument as well, but like what has happened this year with Philadelphia? Like I looked at all the numbers. I had my buddy Sean help me look at all the underlying numbers and the big change for Philadelphia who had a record setting defense last year and a very good defense this year is Andre Blake went from absolutely phenomenal to like very good. Well, there's some uh, interesting notes in this game as well. Johnny Russell had his uh, appeal for his red card denied, so he won't play. It doesn't look like Alan Polito will play. This feels like probably the last time, if I was Bradley Carnell, I'd run out my complete first team, try to lock up the Western Conference, home field advantage, step on your opponent's throat. Your opponent just happens to be your biggest rival that would win the rivalry series for the year. And then after that, focus on health, fitness, and being fresh. They go on the road to Vancouver, and then they're home on decision day against Seattle. Yeah, might as well handle that stuff. But they may have already clinched first place. Also, different from other years, they won't have a bye. A lot of times, it's like first place seed sort of plays hard through the end of the year because they're going to have a bye. You want to get minutes. They don't really have that, even though you're playing a team coming off a wild card. Yeah, and look, this is a little bit of a training ground for them for what a first-round opponent might look like, you know, right around the playoff line uh, at home. So, LA Galaxy Portland Timbers is another good one. Galaxy plan for their lives while Ricky Pooge is limping around on crutches or in a boot. And I guess it's not an injury. It's a pain management issue. But, I mean, if there's pain, it seems like probably there's an injury. And if you're wearing a boot and on crutches, I personally would define that as an injury. Um, but that's been the Galaxy season. Yeah. If anybody who could get injured is injured at the wrong possible time. So, uh, they'll host the Portland Timbers, who are absolutely rolling. It does seem like Evander is a big question mark. Ryan Clark of the Oregonian said he was out, and now he's saying he's questionable. It seems like things are changing rather quickly for Evander, who has a calf injury. And then uh, Jimmy Chara is questionable as well, and it doesn't look like Diego Chara will play. But By the way, Noah Kaliskin was really good against the Rapids in that number eight role for, for Portland. All right, Dave, you know what time it is. Join our league, MLS Squad Pick. Go to MLSSquadPick.com to play, or you can click the link we tweet out. Do we actually tweet them out? Uh, we'll, 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 we'll get we'll on get, that. We'll get right on that. Join yeah, the yeah. official <laughs> Extra Time League. Use code EXTRA, all caps, E-X-T-R-A. Pick five players for your squad. If they all score in the same match day, you win. We have done this as a group. I don't believe we've ever No, won. no, we haven't come close okay, to Okay, but people have won. You can win a free jersey. Up to $160 gift card to MLS store. If all your players score, each round you play gives you one entry for the $10,000 grand prize at the end of the season. Just even play. Just if play. You, don't win. you can get zero. No, no correct answers, which we've attempted on our own. Yeah. And you could still be eligible for that. So apparently there have been six total winners across all the leagues. No one in our league has won. So thank you to all of you out there for solidarity. keeping in solidarity right. with us mm-hmm. and being bad at this. But we appreciate all of you that are playing in our league. If you're not, Please join it because it's fun. And we have stats this week. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Number one pick uh, as far as players is uh, Lucho Costa. 12% of all players have picked Lucho. Hani's right behind them uh, at 12 as well. Denny Bawanga at 11. Cucho at 7. And then Brian White at 6%, which is uh, – Brian White's a good pick, man. He just seems to score in every game he plays right now. Doyle, I see you furiously scrolling through this. Should we not just the... take the five? Yeah, like, shouldn't well, we just take the five? That Laurel, our, our friend Laurel thing? Fowler is reporting that Lucho has a, a calf knock and it Shh, may be – We're trying to win. Oh. Uh, I guess I guess we can win. No, we, everybody, everybody can win. win. No, everybody can win together. Anybody. That's this is a different sort of. So draft. I think we should put Bupens in. Okay. Yeah. I, like I think that. I think at home against Toronto or right, at that's Toronto. Your pick. David Goss's pick. pick Pupenza. Oh, cool. Yeah, okay, yeah, you I have a pick. Doyle, pick. who's your pick? Uh, Faku Torres, home against uh, a, a Montreal team that has given up 35 goals on the road this year. Mm-hmm. Uh let's see. I am gonna go. I'm gonna go Felipe Mora. I love it. There's just zero chance that LA Galaxy are pitching a shutout of any kind. So I'll, t- I'll take Felipe Mora, even though I don't think he should be playing because I that was a red card. Saw that one coming. Against Andrew Grubman. Stand up for my Andrews. Jesus Ferrer against the hungover Houston team. Wow. Nice. I like that one. And That's he it. was rotated midweek. That's Can right. I change my pick? I want to change my pick to Klaus. How about I'll take, I'd be down for Klaus as a squad, as a pick. squad pick. Okay. All right, yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm so trying to record so all Faku of Torres this. Is, yeah, get it down for posterity. Do it. So Klaus is the squad pick. Klaus is our squad pick. Okay, That's a good team. That's a good team, guys. I, think I, this is really good. This I is will week. say to the fans out there, I like the Brian White in DC's yeah. coming cross country. That's a good point. Vancouver's finally home. Yes, yeah, but it's yeah. also yeah. kind Seven of a straight. trap game. Yeah, because they ba- like they were very leggy in the second half at RSL in that entire game against Colorado. And they played midweek against Colorado. Yeah. One of the only ones. Okay, Which is fair. like a great draw for them yeah. from them. The Caps deserve a lot of credit. I have a bunch of really good emails here. The question to Maria and Anders is, will they give us any time to read them or do we have to save them for the next show? Drum roll, please. Maria. Choose one, says Maria. Okay, how about this one? Uh, Nikolai in Nashville. Pat Noonan took the three-time Wooden Spoon winners to Supporter Shield champs in two seasons without overhauling the roster. They're running away with the Shield, sold the DP for eight figures midseason, and made the Open Cup semis, which they lost on PKs only because of messy magic. Not taking away from Bradley Carnell, but what more could Pat Noonan have done to win Coach of the Year? I don't see anything else he could have done, so please elaborate. Just to say, I I agree with Nikolai because I said Pat Noonan when we talked about Mm -hmm. this two shows ago. And you almost convinced me to go Carnell, but I, I, I'm with, I'm with Nikolai in Nashville. Pat Noonan should be the guy. So the only thing I throw out there is breaking the points record. If they are a supporter shield winning team, they are a championship team. All these things are right. If they were a historic team, yeah, that would have put them over the top because what Carnell is going to do this year against the expectations of what other teams in that position have done is historic. Like, if they put up the points we think they'll put up, they will be the greatest expansion team of all time. And I think that will stand above Cincinnati going from fifth to first. Like, like Chirundolo didn't win the coach of the year last year, and he took an LAFC team that had, I think, missed the playoffs in 2021, took them up to 68 points in the shield and eventually a double and did it with a, a bunch of new faces. But the vote's before them. MLS Cup, right? What's that? Isn't the vote before? The vote is before MLS yeah. Cup. I, Pat Noonan, I think most seasons would be a worthy winner. Um, what Carnell has done is historic. If it was for the last two seasons or if it was like a body of work award, which yeah. sometimes it can be depending on who your competition yeah. is. Sometimes it's like someone has finally deserved it right. and should break through. I think Nancy will probably end up as one of those at some point if he right. stays in this league think jim sort of ended up as one of those as well well is it's like eric spolstra never winning coach of the year even though everybody recognizes he's one of the two or three best coaches in, he's in the, Nick NBA. Of the nba yeah or stefan frapp <laughs> both of them never i don't even think they get votes yeah. anyway got uh, vote for uh, jake okay. mercer in toledo ohio Longtime OG listener of the podcast, as in the Greg Lawless and Simon Borg era, wow. 2011, I want to say. I would love for you guys to try and do a reunion episode at some point with some of the former members of the show, like Greg, Simon, Jason Seguini, Nick Fershaw, Jonah Friedman, etc. It would be a lovely moment where the guys who put the hard yards in back in the day can look back on how far the league has come. Love the show, and I'm looking forward to the rest of of the MLS season. Bobby Warshaw would be in that mix. Charlie Davies, Susanna Collins. 
trying to think of any other former uh, folks we had that we not Ben Bear. Ben Absol- Bear, we did have no, a, we, absolutely no. not Ben. Ben Bear, Bear but there's a Ben Bear reference in an email we didn't get to read, which I'll. I bet I'll there's do a lot the of Ben show. Bear references they, in look, the iTunes reviews. They <laughs> said they called him this person Cy in Seattle called him the goat. Wow, oh. Ben Bear, if you've listened to this stout. far, Ben, ben, ben your listen. uncle Cy is sending us emails. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's gonna be stout. All right. Anyway, enjoy match day 35, everyone. Congratulations to the Houston Dynamo U.S. Open Cup champions and Tigres Campeones Cup champions. We will see you on Monday. Adios.